Hi, I'm Fabian, and I have the pleasure to introduce Professor Tim Lenton and uh, later facilitate the Q&A. Now, James Lovelock and Lynn Margulis famously put forward the Gaia hypothesis, according to which living things are part of a planetary scale self-regulating system that has maintained habitable conditions for the past 3.5 billion years. And there was no foresight in this process, but humans are changing that. Our conscious choices are creating a new state moving from Gaia to Gaia 2.0, as Tim Lenton and Bruno Latour have written in Science in 2018. But we're not doing so well, as you might have noticed. And indeed, continuing our current path, we may be pushing the Earth system from being in a state that is conducive to human life and flourishing to a state that is not. Earth, massively perturbed by humans, could move from being a friend to becoming a foe. And really the defining challenge of our time is to absolutely avoid this and instead create a truly sustainable society. And against this background, we don't think there, is a, a, there could be a better speaker uh, to kick off this weekly talk series than Professor Tim Lenton. Tim is the director of the Global Systems Institute and chair in climate change and earth system science at the University, the University of Exeter. When he was an undergraduate, he was inspired by Lovelock's books on Gaia, which, uh, which inspired him to, to write, to study the earth as a whole system and indeed write a wonderful books himself. One is Earth System Science, a very short introduction. And the other one is Revolutions That Made the Earth with Andrew Watson. Available as they say, in all good bookstores near you. So Tim's research spans many domains and indeed disciplines, but for the purposes of, of the event today, he's probably most widely known for together with colleagues drawing up a map of climate tipping elements. Tim has also done a lot of work on trying to find early warning signals for detecting when a climate tipping element is close to transitioning into a less desirable state. And in recent years, he has shifted his focus from understanding and detecting bad climate tipping points towards identifying positive social tipping points to accelerate the transition into a sustainable society. So Tim, we are extremely delighted to have you here and I'm happy to pass it to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Fabian, for the kind introduction and Francisca. Um, yeah, so I, my plan is to talk about uh, both the bad climate tipping points and the positive tipping points, social ones that we need to find and trigger to, to, to try to avoid um, those bad climate tipping points. So it's kind of uh, a miserable first half of the talk uh, where we all kind of get calibrated on the fact that we're in a climate emergency, which I suspect everybody on this call knows. Uh, and then I try to see if I can find some chinks of light that, that we might um, minimize the damages. So I'm gonna be talking about tipping points in climate and social systems. So here's a little toy model of a, a, a system. It could be any kind of complex system that has two alternative states and it started in one of them, but I'm forcing it in a way that that state is losing stability. And at some point it's gonna pass a tipping point. It happened there on my computer <laughs> where a small nudge made a big difference to the uh, fate or the future state of that system. And we use this same essential toy model to describe, well, as we'll see, lots of bits of the climate, but also ecological systems and various um, social dynamics. So this is my little summary across different scales of time on the x-axis and space on the y-axis of a kind of a broad literature um, ranging from the earth sciences and climate science and things in yellowy gold, bit, bits of the climate or the earth system that can pass tipping points through different ecosystems, aquatic in blue, terrestrial in green, at the land water face in grey, um, through to social systems in red that are also recognised to have tipping dynamics. And yeah, the one in the middle, civilization collapse, I think that's what the one we're here to try and avoid that we're all worrying uh, might, might be possible if we carry on the way we're going. So I'm gonna start obviously in the first half dwelling on the bad climate tipping points. What's the state of the science on that? 
but then I want to try to look at the is it credible that there are some positive social tipping points that could accelerate the change we desperately need to get out of a climate and ecological emergency so yeah climate tipping points to start with and then positive tipping points to finish and the work on climate tipping points is i'm going to show you some unpublished new stuff alongside some familiar stuff and the, the work in progress uh credit to to a colleague called Dave Armstrong McKay and other members of what's called the Earth Commission, one of our working groups on this. So this was the uh, the original map we drew up. Actually, we drew it up in the sort of mid 2000s, I think about more than 15 years ago, uh, of what we called the tipping elements in the climate system, where we had evidence from Earth's past and or from future model projections and or from remotely sensed data or from our process based understanding that there were good reason to think that these colored in bits of our life support system could be pushed past a tipping point into a, an alternative state and in almost all cases that would be worse for us it might be a moot point whether a greening of the sahara could be the one beneficial tipping point on the map and of course the antarctic ozone hole had already happened in my lifetime and, and yours so uh, a bit later i'm going to update the map but you can already see there's quite a lot on it unfortunately and that possible tipping points span icy bits of the earth system like major ice sheets in west antarctica or greenland um, aspects of the circulation of the atmosphere or the ocean or the two of them coupled together like Atlantic deep water formation or the El Nino Southern Oscillation or a couple of monsoons here. Or in a third category, key bits of the biosphere like the Amazon or boreal forests. Um, since we uh, published that work, of course, a lot more evidence has come in. And uh, as we'll see, it's mostly uh, alarming evidence that things are accelerating in the wrong direction towards, and I'm afraid, po quite possibly past at least one of these tipping points. So what kind of evidence are we talking about? Um, this slide is just a summary of what, what one can find in climate models, the ones used by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Um, this is just a catalog of a whole bunch of abrupt climate changes that go on in those models. On the left, it just shows at what temperature level do you see abrupt shifts in the model worlds? And on the right, the map is showing you where they're happening in the model worlds. Well, this where they're happening starts to flag up some tipping elements we hadn't spotted. So there's a cluster of things up here towards the end of the alphabet in the labels, which are indicating that several models show that uh, the formation of deep waters in the Labrador Sea to the west of Greenland, that, that what's called deep convection there could collapse and when it does so, you get a transition in the climate that kind of amounts to what we call the little, little ice age in Europe that had much wider spread ramifications. Meanwhile, on the left, what's kind of alarming about what goes on in the model world is they have a bunch of abrupt shifts in the climate happening in the range one to one and a half degrees above pre-industrial temperature. And we're in that range already at 1.1 or 1.2. And then a bunch more at one and a half to two degrees of warming. Models are not reality, but uh, they're trying to be the best models they can of the real climate system. So it is, uh, let's say, alarming that uh, there's a cluster that they predict a cluster of abrupt shifts at low levels of global warming. And they predict a whole lot more at high levels of warming, by the way. It's just there aren't many scenarios going up to high levels of warming. Well, even more compelling evidence is the, is, the, is the evidence you get directly from observations, remotely sensed or, the, or on the ground, as it were, of bits of the climate system. So this is just a map to summarise uh, important things we've learned in the last decade or so about accelerating change in some of those previously identified tipping elements. And then uh, in a couple of cases, identifying some new tipping elements like in East Antarctica or major coral reefs. So the place where we have the most compelling evidence that maybe a tipping point has been passed is in part of the West Antarctic ice sheet, a couple of glaciers that drain into the Amundsen Sea embayment 
they're showing a, a self-accelerating retreat. It's to do with the geometry almost of, of what's what's called uh, this. Well, think of it as the slope of the bedrock, which is below sea level with the ice sheet stuck to the bedrock well below sea level. If there's a downslope of the bedrock as you go into the ice sheet, um, this can create an unstable situation. As the glaciers retreat, the physics is such that uh, it causes them to retreat faster and faster. And we're either very close to or possibly past that tipping point. For a part of the ice sheet that drains about 1.3 metres of global sea level equivalent, so it's conceivable we've made a commitment to that amount of sea level rise just from that part of Antarctica. It's going at a slow-ish rate at the moment, thankfully, but that could be an irreversible commitment already made. Meanwhile, in Greenland, you can't rule out that the accelerating shrinkage of the ice sheet is part, also part of an irreversible transition to a much smaller ice sheet or none at all. If it went to none at all in Greenland, you'd eventually get another seven metres of sea level rise. Um, the bit of West Antarctica that's been destabilised, some of the models would suggest when you lose that, it physically destabilises the rest of that ice sheet. So you lose the whole lot, which is about three and a half metres of sea level. You start adding them up, you realise that maybe we've committed some future generations to a world with 10 metre higher sea level already. Maybe we haven't, hopefully we haven't. But we, well, that's the state of the science there. Uh, and OK, it, on the question of time scale, well, the rate at which that sea level rise arrives is very much dependent on still on the level of warming. So the more we warm the planet up kind of intuitively, the faster the ice sheets collapse. Um, I won't go around everything on the diagram, but we've also got this a lot sort of worrying evidence that there's a fundamental slowdown of the what's called the overturning circulation of the Atlantic Ocean that kind of connects the whole climate system together, sets the position of the band of rainfall in the tropics all the way around the planet, so influences the monsoons in West Africa, India and elsewhere. Um, yeah, so those observations and the models are two of so sources of evidence that have kind of contributed to what I'm showing here, which is a continual reassessment of the likelihood of climate tipping points over time that makes us more and more worried the more we look at the science. So we go back to um, what was called the third assessment report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change in 2001. And at the time, um, when I was a much younger scientist, we thought tipping points could happen, but we thought they wouldn't happen with a reasonable likelihood until you got to say four degrees centigrade of global warming. But as you can see over time with successive IPCC assessments, we bring, we bring our temperature estimates of the tipping points down until now in a couple of recent called special reports, we have the collective assessment that we're already in the danger zone of a significant likelihood of passing climate tipping points at 1.1 or 1.2 degrees of global warming. Going up to the Paris target of 1.5 degrees C doesn't look safe to me from where I'm sitting and two degrees C definitely wouldn't be safe, would be, I would say, straight out dangerous. So what we've, we've, what we've talked about there is an independent kind of assessment as if the tipping points weren't connected together. But of course, um, as Lovelock and the Gaia hypothesis taught us, uh, that Earth is an interconnected um, system to many of us like a living system. And just like you or I, if you like fundamentally harm one of our organs, it's probably gonna have ramifications for one of the other organs in metaphorical terms. And for sure, I'm afraid we now have scientific evidence for kind of causal interactions between these tipping elements. So for, so for example, we know that the Arctic region is warming two to three times as fast as the rest of the planet because the sea ice is retreating as it does so uh, a highly reflective white ice surface is replaced by a highly unreflective absorbing dark ocean surface that, that soaks up far more heat from the sun. Now that 
enhanced Arctic warming is contributing to the accelerating melt of the Greenland ice sheet. It's leading to extra rainfall and snowfall and basically precipitation into the Arctic, which is fresh water, just as the melt from the ice sheet is fresh water. That fresh water pouring into the North Atlantic region is a problem for this Atlantic circulation because that whole circulation is driven by the fact that when waters that are heading northwards and are losing heat to the atmosphere getting colder and they're evaporating water to the atmosphere getting saltier, by getting colder and saltier, normally they get dense enough to sink from the very top of the ocean to the very bottom on either side of Greenland. But now we've got all this extra fresh water pouring into those regions of the North Atlantic. It's making the surface waters fresher, which means less dense, which is, means less prone to sinking, which is weakening this great overturning and can ultimately break it. As it weakens, uh, Earth's history has told us that what you're doing is you're weakening a massive transport of heat from the Southern Hemisphere to the Northern Hemisphere. Um, so as you do that, you this is setting the position of the rainfall band all around the tropics. It's going to drag it southwards. So that has impacts. It affects monsoon rains in South America here, Africa, India, as I mentioned before. And leaving all that heat behind in the Southern Ocean, that's a problem for the ice sheets down there because there's, they're, they're stuck to the rock below sea level and it's warming of the ocean with its enormous heat capacity that threatens them more than warming of the atmosphere. In other words, we've got tipping points that where tipping one increases the likelihood of tipping another. And in the worst case scenario, it will be what my friend John Charnover calls domino dynamics. You, you, tip, you tip one thing, it tips another, it tips another. And then we might as well stop talking about separate tipping points, because then we'd be talking about what, what if anyone was alive to reflect on what had happened afterwards, they'd look back and think, well, that was just one big global tipping point catastrophe. And that's what we referred to as the transition to a hothouse earth in the paper in 2018. Um, we sort of cartoon it here as if you fall off a kind of kind of metaphorical cliff here out into a, into a, a different hotter state of the planet. Uh, certainly a state of the planet with much higher sea level so and much less ice. So I sometimes think of it as the wet house earth. This is a place we do not want to go. So the task is to restabilize the system, of course. Now, since all of that, um, here's a little bit of the new work we're doing. It probably doesn't change the main message, but we've been updating the maps of tipping points. We've kind of split them into what I'm calling now the global core tipping elements and we see a few things have been added to this map we've got the east antarctic ice sheet as a whole and we've got these things called east antarctic subglacial basins they display the same potential instability as the west antarctic ice sheet there's a couple of them that each give about the equivalent of three or four meters of sea level rise if we if we trigger them into breakdown and wow the east antarctic ice sheet uh, well it's that's, that's even worse, that, that, as we'll see, that's hopefully tipping that's a long way off, but it's not out of range, and there's about more than 50 metres of sea level rise there. Yeah, I mentioned the Labrador Sea Convection, that's crept on the map. And then we've got things I'm calling regional impact climate tipping elements, and some things have appeared on this map, like low latitude coral reefs that we know are under serious threat, even at one and a half degrees of global warming. And we've also got the extra polar mountain glaciers also under threat of large scale loss by around two degrees of warming. So what we've been doing is summarizing all the evidence we could find from the literature as to where are the temperature thresholds for each of the things that have just appeared on the last two maps. So that's what this slide is about. Again, I like to use these burning embers, sort of likelihood scales, where the bottom of the ember, if you like, is where one model shows a tipping point. And the top of the ember is the model with the sort of highest temperature at which the tipping point happens. And the dotted line is my, or Dave's, or my guess, guesstimate or best estimate of where we think the tipping point might be for each of these elements. The ones in bold, I think, are the global core ones, and the ones in less bold font are the regional impact ones. We compare on the right to where, what level of global warming are we heading to with current policies in the sort of yucky dark grey? 
about 2.7 degrees centigrade. If we were perhaps naively optimistic and we believed every pledge and target made in Glasgow in November were going to be adhered to, still the best, the very best case scenario is about 1.8 degrees C of warming. And the problem is, well, we think several of these tipping points are at risk now at, at current warming. And certainly our best guess is their thresholds, their tipping points might be around one and a half degrees of warming. So let's hope we're wrong about all of this. But uh, one can set that in the context of past pipe um, warming here. So we're just seeing the same, the same burning embers now I've kind of put the past climate change through the last ice age close to a maximum, through the last 10,000 years of all civilizations developing here, and then the warming that can occur this century. And now we get some inf extra information on the right. We see some of the IPCC's different scenarios or temperature trajectories into the future. Uh, we color code those, and then you can kind of ask the question, well, depending on which scenario we go down, which tipping points do we pass and when? And that, that's what's kind of semi-summarized at the bottom right. Well, the take-home message is even in a very hard to achieve minimal warming in the future, we're still probably gonna pass four, four of these tipping points if our estimates are right, but we could delay it somewhat. And obviously if we go anywhere higher than one and a half degrees of warming, we just add extra tipping points uh, and we bring them sooner so that in the worst case you've got more than 10 of them um, and it's it's inconceivable we'd ride that out so that that was the bad news um hopefully uh suitably sobering now we've got to ask ourselves blimey um are we completely doomed or is there something we can do to accelerate the change we need to minimize this risk and that's what this part of the talk's about now. Uh, the possibility that there are actually some signs of positive tipping points of social change that are all hopefully being part of that, that could uh, um, help us get back out of clear emergency situation. So you all know this, I suspect, but the, to limit warming to one and a half degrees C globally, um, we with a 50 50 chance which isn't a great chance not great odds uh global greenhouse gas emissions have to stop going up the green line and they have to come down something that looks a bit like the red line give or take some uncertainty so we've got to get to zero greenhouse gas emissions certainly by 2050 possibly sooner certainly sooner if we don't believe that it's possible to do what's indicated here, which is massive greenhouse gas removal from the atmosphere in the second half of the century. I certainly have some severe doubts over the scale of that, which is actually possible. So we've got to achieve a spectacular rate of technological, social, arguably ecological, social ecological change, something like a seven to 10% year on year reduction in greenhouse gas emissions from now on, and we're not doing it yet. Emissions are bounced back to the pre-pandemic levels. So the only hope I think of accelerating the change we need is to believe that there is an alternative state for society and the economy and the energy systems, transport and everything else. And to believe that it's possible to uh, find and trigger some, some tipping points to get from current state business as usual to that other state which you might think of as lowering the hilltop or, or perhaps trying to push the ball up the hilltop or a bit of both. But what this really amounts to is trying to identify and be part of uh, reinforcing feedbacks that can propel change out of this state and perhaps weaken the, the damping feedbacks that maintain the current status quo, meaning things like you know, still perverse subsidies for fossil fuel extraction and burning. So have we got any reason to think rapid, really rapid social change, profound social change can happen? Um, yes, that it's happened again in the past. This is my, a distant relative of mine. This is Lillian Lenton, photographed in the year 1913. She is in prison in the photograph because she was implicated in the burning down of the tea house in Kew Gardens in London. 
as she was one of the famous suffragettes. Now, unfortunately, well, in prison, as part of her protest, Lillian went on hunger strike, but as with some of the other hunger strikers, she was force fed at the under government order in prison. Uh, and they put the tube down the wrong way. They put it into her lungs. So that nearly killed her. The government, the government proceeded to cover up what had happened and claim she was ill because she was on hunger strike. Well, suffice to say that lie didn't um, stand the test of public scrutiny. And this was one of the things that turned public opinion against the government and in favor of votes for women um, in the UK which didn't come that quickly, but was granted to those women over from age 30 or above in the year 1918, I think, and 10 years later to, to women of 18 or over. So Lillian wasn't best impressed because she was under 30 when the vote was granted to those over 30, but she played a key part in what was a fundamental change in our democratic system. Now, of course, we've seen rapid social change and some of us are part of it now, and a lot of credit goes to this, this young woman, Greta. And what does Greta's protest um, teach us? It, it teaches us some classic lessons of what I call positive feedback. By protesting, skipping school on Fridays, um, she makes it incrementally easier for the next person to join her in the protest and skip school, which makes it incrementally easier for the next person to join and so on and so on. This is a phenomenon in academics called social contagion. It's well understood to be behind political revolution. And sure enough, within months, millions of people around the world were marching for more decisive climate action or government action. And of course, governments did produce, uh, you know, declarations of climate emergency. This is the European Parliament doing so in autumn 2019. But I guess we all know that, and Greta certainly knows that, Political, political rhetoric doesn't cut it with Gaia or with the climate system. Only, only meaningful action to, to change greenhouse gas emissions makes any difference. So have we got any reason to think that could be starting? Well, in the past, there have been very fast technological or social technological changes. A famous example that we would look upon perhaps with a dim, dim eyes now is, is a transition that happened, well, when Lillian, my relative, was alive. Um, if we look in New York City in the year 1900, this is Fifth Avenue, New York City on Easter Parade Day in 1900. And the task is meant to be to spot the one automobile in, a, in the street full of horse-drawn carriages. It is somewhere in the middle, about there. But 13 years later, you have the opposite challenge. You have to spot the one horse-drawn carriage when everybody else is in an automobile. Uh, as a clue, it's in a very similar part of the street, actually. It's just over there. And this tipping point in personal transport unfolds within that decade across US cities. Of course, it carries on spreading around the world. It seems bad to us now because the internal combustion engine kind of won the race. Um, but actually in the middle of the transition, at one point there were 30% battery electric vehicles, which we can come back to in the discussion as to why they didn't come to dominate. Well, now, finally, uh, a century or so later, we start to see uh, a tipping point for electric electrification of personal mobility, scooters, bikes, and, and automobiles. Uh, it's really happening first in Norway, it has something to do with these characters. Uh, those of, in the audience of my age will recognize the pop band AHA. You might not recommend, re recognize Frederick in the middle, but, um, but he was instrumental as his NGO Bologna in, uh, with AHA importing this uh, hobby converted Fiat Panda, electric Fiat Panda into Norway, persuading the government not to rid not to levy a registration tax on the vehicle because they argued it was a clean car and thus set an incentive for anybody else who chose an electric vehicle thereon to save a significant amount of money in doing so. And later on, they persuaded the government eventually to scrap road tolls for electric cars. These were key enabling conditions that have played some part in the fact that Norway is now fundamentally shifted to electric personal transport. 
here is kind of the data as summarized by Robbie Andrew for cars. Uh, electric vehicles are still only a tiny fraction of, of car purchases in 2010. And as of 2020, they were more than half uh, and they were over 60%, I think, in 2021. So a tipping points happened. I'm not saying, by the way, that electric vehicles are perfect in every respect, but they, I can tell you for sure they're a massive improvement on petrol or diesel ones from the point of view of real meaningful change in greenhouse gas emissions. And I looked at this Why Norway with uh, Simon Sharp, friend and colleague in the UK Cabinet Office, and we just plotted how the market share of electric vehicles across European countries depended on the price difference to to you, the consumer, if you went to a dealership to buy a car. And you see a really, we say, strongly nonlinear relationship. Um, most European countries have been bumbling along until recently at five-ish percent market share for electric vehicles, even when they're almost the same price as a petrol or diesel car, but where they were the same price to buy a Noi, bam, um, the tipping point happened. Why, why is that interesting? Well, partly it's interesting to know, uh, well, that it is making a difference to emissions, partly interesting because one of the key things that propels this transformation is what's called economies of scale, a reinforcing feedback whereby the more batteries uh, are made, the cheaper the next battery gets to make. And that's the key thing adding to or controlling the price of the electric car. And that's sketched up here. But the other reason this tipping point is interesting is because, well, it can certainly spread around the world, but as it does so, it might enable other tipping points. So in the case of Norway, it's really some clever policy incentives that are shown to be able to trigger a tipping point and other countries could seek to emulate that and are beginning to do so. But once you get this thing going, basically this economy of scales is such that the more people buy electric bikes, scooters, cars, whatever, uh, the cheaper the next one gets to make, the batteries are getting spectacularly cheaper, the transition becomes self-propelling, and then it's interesting because then cheap batteries start opening up other avenues for fundamental action that makes a difference for climate change, like possible electrification of goods transport up to a certain mass of vehicle, um, perhaps more interesting, maybe it's the thing, one of the things that will finally persuade the oil firms to stop making oil firms and be something else. But most interesting to me is that cheap batteries are a key enabler for the transition to renewable power, because basically the, 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 the main technical issue that, ha that has to be and is solved for renewable power and is being solved is when you want to put the kettle on isn't always when the sun's shining or the wind is blowing. So you need cheap storage or large and very smart grids to have a 100% renewable power system. And this is, you know, this tipping point from the transport sector is giving us really cheap storage of electricity, which brings me on to talking about the final tipping point example, I guess, of, that's actually happened, which is in the UK where I'm speaking from, we've seen a tipping point basically shutting coal burning out of electricity generation just in less than the last 10 years. So black line here is the contribution of coal burning to UK power generation. And up here in 2012, it was about 40% of power generation in the UK it's now down at sort of 1%. And renewables in the yellow, the blue and the green have picked up most of the slack. This tipping point was triggered by pretty modest price on carbon in the power sector alone. And it looked at the first instance, it would be entirely reversible, but actually what it triggered was investors to pull out of coal burning or um, because they weren't making money. And then it caused utilities companies to pull out of coal burning and to do irreversible things like destroy this coal power station in Oxfordshire in the UK. And by the way, they continue the, to be destroyed around the UK at the moment. So we're never going back on that. That's a fundamental tipping point. And it's one that the climate can actually notice in the sense that the UK has decarbonized faster than any other country in the world, thanks largely to this. 
So the good news is economies of scale again, the renewable energy revolution is coming. This is how solar panels get cheaper, the more solar panels you make. And it's a log scale, right? Well, it's a log log scale, but that this decline in price is spectacular and it carries on. And as it carries on and is projected to carry on into the future, we get within a decade to a point where in many parts of the world, you'll be generating power from solar panels or, or equally from offshore wind power in some places at, at a fraction of the price of any fossil fuel. Some, some analysts think the solar, solar will generate a fifth of the price of any fossil fuel. Well, that, with that, that is guaranteed to fundamentally tip energy um, generation around the world. And we're already beginning to see that that's the case. So this was the first half of 2020, the cheapest form of power generation if you took out the perverse subsidies and tax credits still favoring fossil fuels in black or gray. You then find most of the world is in yellow, gold or blue, indicating that either solar or wind power is the cheapest way of generating electricity already. So this is great because there's a feedback or an interaction between these things. I mentioned how the low cost batteries enable the renewable power. Um, but of course, if you clean up electricity and it's getting ever cheaper, well, that's it's just opening up. It's reinforcing the switch to electrifying transport and it's opening up other avenues like will overproduce clean power, then we'll start to, you know, produce green hydrogen and use that where we need to, um, certainly in, in some of the transport sectors, that's perhaps the better option and so on. It's what I think of or call uh, a sort of positive tipping cascade across the economy that could really get us somewhere uh, on tackling climate change rapidly. Finally, it's not obviously about just energy and transport and material stuff. It's about this is this challenge is about our relation to ecology, to other living things. And the great thing about ecology and, and Gaia is it's full of its own self-reinforcing feedback. So if you if as humans we choose to work in the right way with other living systems we can certainly have the potential to tip them positively in a desired direction, and that includes food systems. So this is a sort of small scale example, but this is a muscle bed, edible blue mussels. They, by the way, mussels self-organize and create these beautiful patterned mud flats. They stabilize the mud and create a larger mud flat on which they can flourish. But humans can interact intelligently with these systems and with very crude technological interventions like this fencing system, you can, Restabilize the mud flats, give, get the positive feedback going whereby the mussels create their own massive muscle bed that you can sustainably harvest. So right now I'm working with others on what are the positive tipping points in food, diet and land system transformation that might be coming or that we might collectively trigger. And that's a lovely case of a mixture of things going on, like some of us choosing to change our diets whilst at the same time, new technology is giving plant-based or alternative protein meat substitutes a similar or even cheaper price than meat, and, a, and they have a massively lower impact on the climate, land, and ecology. So we're trying, in a sense, to forecast and see how to trigger those tipping points that are coming. And the point of this way of thinking is to maybe give us back a sense of some kind of agency or power in the face of the frightening threat from the climate tipping points. Actually, we're not even asking ourselves to uh, go on hunger strike and risk our own lives in prison, although, you know, some of you may feel moved to do that. Um, that's everyone's personal choice. What I'm kind of saying is, without going to that extreme, uh, as a civil society, uh, we have the power to be part of this change. I mean, we all consume to some degree and we can make choices about our consumption that really matter. But also we might find ourselves forming partnerships as academics or scientists, for example, not just with civil society action, but with, heaven forbid, the finance sector. You might think they're evil, but there's a lot of people who want positive change in that sector. And if they can move the capital in the right direction, they can certainly help the change happen. And I've and okay, policy is policy, but some of it is, is with us on this. 
And certainly the media, some of the media is there wanting to tell, be part of telling this story of, of positive tipping points and transformative change. So I guess that's my closing kind of message. <laughs> I've, I've been trying to say, look, you know this already, we're in a climate emergency, the climate tipping points are possibly here, one might already be passed and others are rapidly approaching. The only way we can limit warming to well below two degrees C is to find and trigger some of these positive tipping points. Have I tried to show you that, well, the some are already starting to happen, others are visible on the horizon and we could all be a part of triggering them. Thanks very much. Excellent. Thank you for, for the for all of you. Uh, I'm especially uh, um, happy that you mentioned the, the update to the tipping element paper, which I recently read. And I, I have to say, I had I had to get a drink after I learned about the convection in the Labrador Sea, um, especially because you put the best estimate at 1.8 and 1.1 as the low bound. So, so that's also maybe something we've already triggered, or at least they're coming close to. Well. Yes. Um, Yes, Fabian. In fact, it's not been entirely stable in the last decade or so. It has a habit of switching on and off. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so uh, yeah, that's the Q and A now. Um, I'd, I'd be happy to. Um, uh, if anybody has a question, you could raise your hand. Um, in. Yeah, using Zoom, and then I can call on you, or you can write in the chat, and and I can mention the question you have. Maybe until that picks up, I, I do want to mention, and we've had these conversations before, that sort of the map of tipping elements you sketch, they're all defined in, in terms of critical thresholds of temperature, right? So you have Greenland 1.5, mm -hmm. West Antarctic Ice Sheet 1.5, and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, but in the paper, you also mentioned that there's some indication that you know, some systems can tip when, when a critical rate is exceeded. So I think Lohmann and Ditlefsen showed this for the AMOC last year. And I'm, and I'm, wondering, I'm wondering whether there are other tipping elements besides the AMOC where you can imagine that there's a rate dependency that, that we might be missing. And maybe, maybe just to add on that more broadly, given Earth's history, can you, can you reflect a little bit on just the speed with which we're forcing the climate? And, and oh, yeah. Absolutely, Fabian. Well, yes, to answer the second question first, the current rates of climate change are basically un unprecedented in the context of what we can tell from Earth history. I don't think it's ever been forced this fast. Um, to go back to the first part of the question, well, an example Hopefully many of you heard about the permafrost and aware of that being thawed by warming, but part of the permafrost is rich, rich in carbon, um, richer than the rest of it. And what happens when you thaw permafrost? You're like taking food out of the deep freeze for the microbes that live frozen, cryogenically stored, if you like, in, in the permafrost. And they go to work eating that carbon as soon as they're out of the deep freeze. But what happens when you eat a meal? Um, you get warmer because you're metabolizing, right? So when the bugs break the carbon down in the permafrost, they release heat that can thaw more permafrost, that can release, that can release more bugs, more heat, more thawing. That one has the potential to go into runaway, as we call it, a true tipping point. And that one is sensitive to the rate at which we warm the Arctic regions. So you have to warm it above a certain rate for that thing to go into runaway. Gardeners on the call will also maybe know that sometimes uh, compost bombs catch fire. You get, and for exactly the same reason, um, it's the bugs generating too much heat that's too concentrated and you get to the point of combustion. So that's another example. Um, one could get, the, uh, there, there are probably a few more but I think it's perhaps intuitive that, yeah, the faster you hit, hit the system, um, the more you might risk in some cases, these kind of behaviors. Right, I'm looking at the chat now, I've got some questions. Yeah, there, there are a couple, maybe uh, Peter, you, you raised your hand, you could. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I've, uh, I wonder, 
a personal level, uh, do you find that by speaking about all of this so regularly, about the tipping points and the consequences, that you have emotionally detached from it? No, <laughs> no. I might sound I might sound calm, but maybe I just am by personality. Um, no, no. You can't emotionally detach from it, Peter. But you uh, can. Uh, how, do, how are you able to cope with it emotionally? Because it's pretty by working in this stuff by working on the positive tipping points. Because basically, I would say I'm very lucky, very, I don't think many of us are privileged to have spent, I don't know, 30 years trying to understand complex, often living systems and how complex systems work. And most, I tell me if I'm wrong, but I think my perception of many policymakers, many business leaders, many social actors is currently they feel completely paralyzed by complexity. They look at the enormity of this challenge and they're just like, oh, I can't do anything. It's a log jam. It's a stalemate. Uh, if I did something, it wouldn't make any difference because blogs over there or imagine person Z over there wouldn't do anything and blah, blah, blah. Well, basically, I'm lucky. I've, I've, I've spent my whole life trying to understand these complex dynamics. And once you get into that, you see the world's more beautiful and non-linear and kind of creative than, than you might have been brought up to think it was. And that's why I can then spend some time, you know, trying really hard to look for those signs that there could be positive tipping points without descending into naive optimism. <laughs> And that way you find a chink of light that helps you get out of bed in the morning. Um, because you think, you also know in my case that the biosphere is super, super creative and resilient at the level of the microbes. And so I'm afraid I am, you know, a deep ecologist by training and I can identify with other species uh, and I value them uh, intrinsically. So this might sound misanthropic, uh, don't take it the wrong way, but I, I take some comfort from the knowledge that uh, life as a whole um, will find a new way of flourishing, whether we get our shit together or not. <laughs> so that's yeah. that's me. Thanks. Cheers. Chris, do you want to ask your question? Yeah, thanks, uh, Fabian. And thanks, Tim, for your uh, disheartening and then heartening uh, uh, lecture. So I've also been thinking uh, about tipping points also in the context of activism. And I'm really curious, obviously you've been studying this longer and, and more in depth than I have, whether you've identified certain principles or heuristics or analytic tools that we can use to kind of make an analysis in our own context, be it a company or whatever we uh, choose to, to work on to, to identify these tipping points. That's, that's exactly what with, I'm inviting other friends to join me, but that's exactly with a bunch of colleagues what we're trying to do, Chris. We've got a paper coming out Wednesday next week um, that is called, probably rather too academically, Operationalizing Positive Tipping Points Towards Global Sustainability, but is really a first attempt at coming up with a recipe of which actors with whom in which order doing what actions or interventions have been shown in past examples or in the theory or in both to, to be able to trigger positive tipping. And the good news is there are at least, I counted about 10 distinct models of how the dynamics can happen. And many, many case studies, albeit sometimes on small scales of, of the kind of coalitions of action that can make them happen. So out of that, we tried to start to draw out what I think of as, as the recipe for the positive tipping. And the way I describe it is, as of next week's paper, we've got several of the ingredients and some of the cooks correctly identified, hopefully, but we haven't quite baked the cake yet, meaning there's still some more work to do. Because it's not, it's not a trivial problem to, to keep working on it. actually which actors which coalitions in which order are going to be most effective to make the change happen. But of course, you don't need to let the perfect be the enemy of the good, right? You don't have to have the full answer to have some useful clues. So, so thanks for the question. This is exactly what I, I'm trying to work on um, and invite others to join in. Yeah. Okay, uh, there, there are many questions, so I have to uh, make some selection here. Um, one, I, I think, it's interesting because it points to the fact that you know, a system can tip into a positive or negative state. 
and this person is asking whether you have any comments on sort of negative social tipping points uh, uh, and their likelihood. Yeah, this is my biggest worry in this kind of thinking is if is of course you've got like all of you've got to be concerned with how do you ensure the transformative change is socially just as well as uh, what we need to get out of climate and ecological crisis and by definition once you get the tipping dynamics going you have to accept that you're not going to be able to control them so this whole way of thinking is a direct challenge to what academics refer to as modernism or just the, the indoctrination we've given ourselves culturally for the last 300 years in the West, where we, we, we are brought up to believe we can control the outcome of everything, including all the mm. complexities of Gaia in our society, which is obviously a, a delusion, but, um, but you kind of have to get beyond that. You have to accept in the positive tipping of dynamics, you might start something that you're going, not going to be able to control. You've just got to, I think of it as a fell run error, as you've got, it's like a scree run in fell running. You're hurtling downhill. You've got to try and ride the wave, but you can't stop the wave or think of your own metaphor. Well, the risk there is of course, what if nefarious actors decide to, to try and trigger these dynamics in a, in a direction that might, some of us might object to. Luckily, they don't seem to be smart enough yet to have spotted that, but that is definitely a risk. So as with all aspects of tackling the emergency, um, it's sort of beholden on all of us in a democracy to, uh, to, uh, to, to make our voices heard about making sure that those who might suffer from the transformation itself are given a social safety net whilst at the same time, those who are already spectacularly rich and opposing progress, we should have no moral qualms about their, suffer their taking a hit. But of course, they're the ones opposing change. So yeah, those are, that, that's a sort of big picture answer. But, but yeah, right now, if you want a specific case, um, there might be different degrees of, uh, of of how good a, a tipping point could be. I mean, they could, could be going in a good direction, but there could be a better option. And it, right now in the UK, you have the, you have the natural gas companies lobbying for so-called blue hydrogen and to like hydrogen everything, including heating our homes. Well, this is not the best option for what it's worth. Heat pumps are in, in the UK. So we might get a suboptimal tipping point. It's not exactly nefarious, but we don't want the suboptimal one. We want to go down the better path. And again, we have to get switched onto this and we have to make our public voices heard about those things. Yeah. Maybe one, one uh, um, final question that, that goes to the, for instance, this, this, this tension that you've mentioned that at the same time, we have this huge drastic emissions reductions that we, we have to do. Mm. We have, power structure, the fossil fuel industry that buys most of the governments as our opponents. Um, and this, this person asks, well, uh, I'm reading this, it's quite long. So the issue, he says, goes further than just reducing energy emissions and changing our diet. Emissions reductions 10% per year is historically unprecedented, even in times of massive economic disruption, such as the post-Soviet transition. The change we'll need uh, to undergo will necessarily be more drastic than that. What's at issue, uh, the person points out, uh, as many in the recent degrowth literature have pointed out, seems to be that we need to fundamentally challenge the basic assumptions that have driven our economic system in the last 500 years. And the examples Tim, you brought up, such as women's suffrage and various consumption changes, also electric vehicles and so on, which are, you know, the, is a fraction of the, of, the, of the emissions, for example, do not come close to challenging that. Perhaps the closest analogy is the industrial revolution itself. Yeah. The question then is, how do you evaluate the ability of positive social tipping points you mentioned to actually bring really this radical shift uh, about? Yeah, that's a great question. I've got a lot of sympathy with the questioner, but as Donella Meadows, who's like the, the, the great champion of systems thinking would have put it, um, it's not necessarily the most effective strategy to try to come in and change the paradigm as your first objective. Uh, she talked in terms of leverage points with great wisdom, 
And if she was still alive, I think Donella would have, her, if you read her, what the writing she left, she would uh, suggest perhaps that there are other leverage points that are sort of in the middle of the lever as she pitched it, things like the stuff I'm talking about that provide an entry point to accelerate change, but then their consequences can, can cascade and ramify, and they could ultimately conceivably end in changing the paradigm, but you don't try to start there in simple terms. Of course, I, I could be wrong about that, but uh, one can paint a picture that that is conceivable. And one can also, I think, uh, as, you, as the questioner points out with the example perhaps of the Industrial Revolution or some others you might choose, audience, um, you sometimes have these historical cases where seemingly not not huge or innocuous changes that aren't setting out to totally change the paradigm ultimately do completely change the paradigm if you see what i mean mm -hmm. so i personally think that uh, and everyone else is welcome to take a different view but i personally think you have to start from where you are um in the, your efforts to transform the system you're within um and simply uh, jumping to to an opposition is a legitimate position to take, but isn't guaranteed to be uh, more effective, in my view. Um, I'm not saying I'm right, though. I I also think that the problem is that I, I listen to and I read the degrowth arguments, but um, I can I think it's one has to nuance that argument very carefully. Definitely degrowth for the ultra super rich, but degrowth would do enormous harm to many people in, for example, sub Saharan Africa who need, who want, need, and deserve access directly to clean solar powered electricity and, and so many other benefits that will come from that. So, yeah, but it, so it's, to, to, it's a nuance, it's a nuanced thing. And and as for how I would assess things, I, I, I'm a scientist, so our job is to, to look at the numbers. And so I make my assessments based on the contribution to reducing greenhouse gas emissions, which is the prime target. And in the case of transforming the global energy system, whether you're doing it, I suppose you portray it as me describing doing that from within the way the system is now, fine because i looked at the number i've looked at the numbers that is not a trivial part of reducing global emissions and ni neither is transforming food and land systems that i also gave an example and neither is transport in fact between the three of those that's i can't remember the exact percentage but that would be you know if you take it in a broad sense that's that's the majority of emissions so mm. so all of those yeah. things together are not a hundred percent of solving the problem, but they're probably eighty or ninety percent ballpark, and that's pretty. That's a pretty good start. Um, but yeah, this is it. This is don't, we can't let the perfect be the enemy of the good here. We have to. It's more important to find whatever ways possible to start accelerating the change we need. Uh, and on that point, you know, I don't. I think it's probably not probably not productive to argue theoretically or ideologically about as long as we could agree on the goal of, mm. of where we where we want to get to or the vision of where we want to head. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I do have to say that I think the growth is fairly clear that it's uh, equitable downscaling and that the global north basically should, you know, reduce atmospheric space and development space for the global south to develop yeah, uh, something, I, something i wholeheartedly support yeah. and try to yeah. that we as long as we all by by which i mean i i try to do that in my own personal actions because that's the acid test here i mean that is really the acid test mm. yeah yeah all right well i think uh, i yeah i think this uh, thank you tim again for for your time i do think because we are running already a little late uh, we have to uh, move on to the next part. Um, if you if you can stick around and maybe ask us a question in the chat or also just um, definitely. Sorry, I didn't leave it at I'll try and answer the questions in the chat. No, thank you, thank you so much. And um, there is a there there is a scene in, in in the Lord of the Rings 
I think about a lot in the context of the climate emergency. And it's, um, you know, it's Frodo saying, I wish the ring had never come to me. I wish none of this had happened. And then Gandalf says, so do all who live to see such times, but that is not for them to decide. All we have to decide is what to do with the time that is given to us. And so I want to pass it on to Mike, a co-founder of Scientist Rebellion, to talk about actions. Thanks, Fabian. Uh, thanks, everyone, for being here. It's amazing how many people have come. And uh, thanks, Tim, uh, so much for yeah, really inspiring talk. Um, uh, yeah. Um, so uh, what I'm going to do is just kind of give a background to Scientist Rebellion, why, why we're a thing, what we're trying to achieve, bit of our background and what we're doing in April and to ask people here to help us um, achieve a positive tipping point. Um, so, you know, as Tim spoke about, we definitely desperately need positive tipping points, of course. Our approach is to have scientists be uh, leading from the front, right? So the point of Scientist Rebellion is to supplement uh, talks and speeches and reports with vitally, vitally needed direct action by scientists. So for the last 30, 40 longer years, we have only had uh, talks and clearly that's that's not worked. Um, emissions have continued to rise and that we are not near any kind of emergency decarbonisation. Um, it could sound like I'm overly criticizing the scientific community. Obviously, without scientists like Tim and others, we wouldn't even know we we're in a crisis. However, that being said, um, there is a special responsibility for those who are aware, like Fabian was just talking about, those who know about this crisis to, um, to go above and beyond. And if words do not work, then we must use direct action. We must use nonviolent direct action. And that is what we do. So um, the reason, so uh, there's a couple of reasons, there's, well, there's lots of reasons why this, this should be the case, but we're, a couple of them are, how can we expect the general public to believe that we're in a climate crisis and act like we're in a climate crisis if the people who uh, tell them do not act as if that's true? So a metaphor would be that if you were sat next to someone um, in a building and they said, uh, they calmly told you that the building's on fire, the roof is about to collapse, and we're both about to die. And they said that with, you know, great calm and like, you know, it's going to be bad, right? It would be reasonable for that person to say, I don't believe you. However, if that person said, the roof's on fire, we're about to die, smashes a window and drags you out of that building, well, then you're probably going to believe them. So the metaphor is clear that we believe that you gain credibility through personal sacrifice. So the core of nonviolence and the reason why it works, and as Tim pointed out, the reason for positive social tipping points through nonviolence is because of the sacrifice of people like Greta, uh, the people are part of Extinction Rebellion that I'm proud to be part of, part of other movements. It's through putting something on the line and saying, this is what I'm willing to risk for others to be convinced, right? And there's great power, but it cannot be, or I do not believe, and people within Scientist Rebellion do not believe that scientists are above this. They should be leading from the front and leading by example. Um, there, you know, this puts an extra pressure on the scientific community, right? They not only have to study and communicate the crisis, but also act, right? But as has been referenced to, um, the great Albert Einstein said, those who have the privilege to know have the duty to act. And we use that quote a lot within the group because we are privileged to know about this crisis. It's a horrible thing to know. It's a, it's a, well, you know, it, devastating truth uh, to know, but it's still a privilege. Not many people know about it. So the people who do know absolutely have the responsibility to act as if that's the truth. And that means putting something on the line. It means risking your job, risking your liberty through arrest, risking your health through a hunger strike, as has been shown to work time and time and time again. So like Tim mentioned, the suffragettes, you could also say uh, Gandhi, Martin Luther King, Otpur, countless times 
And what's also worth saying is that every one of those groups was told that it wouldn't work, right? So Martin Luther King was told it wouldn't work um, in a democracy. It had to be under British rule or under empire wrong. Then Otfel were told it wouldn't work um, because that was an authoritarian regime. It worked. So we have to have confidence. There's good reason to have confidence in nonviolence. Right. So that's kind of very broadly why scientist rebellion uh, exists. It's to make a scientist act as if the truth is real so that others believe us. Right. So a brief history of scientist rebellion. So it was co-founded by myself and Dr. Tim Hewler in September 2020 um, by doing the polarizing uh, but effective act of throwing paint at the Royal Society. We did that because the Royal Society does not endorse civil disobedience um, as a way to combat the climate crisis. And we believe that unless you adopt that position, you are not acting as if the truth is real. Um, our next major action was in March 2021, when we had a global action in 10 countries. Uh, uh, sorry, 15 countries involved low level civil disobedience, but it was still in August 2021, we leaked. So the IPCC Working Group 3 report, uh, Summary for Policymakers, um, we leaked that before it was to be published. It was the first leak of its kind. Um, and then in Madrid, we had the first major action of scientists where around 20 scientists uh, threw paint at the Ministry of Ecological Transition uh, in Madrid. And then uh, the last action to talk about uh, uh, that we've done was at COP26, where we made history as the first ever mass arrest of scientists over the climate crisis. It had never happened before. We've had individual arrests, like for James Hansen, but it was the first time we had a mass. It was 21 of us blocked the um, King George V bridge for five hours. We were the only group that was able to pull off an action. XR tried, other groups tried, and they all failed because of the police presence, but we made it happen, um, and it was incredible. Um, thank you. Yes, the COP action was amazing. Um, so I'm rushing through this because I appreciate we've all been here for a while and hopefully we all want to talk and discuss what we've heard. So this is all well and good. We've made history, but obviously that's not good enough. It's the end of the world. We have to act like it. So we have to act. Uh, we have to think big and we have to act now. No messing around. So what's coming will change the world. It is, will be the beginning of the climate revolution. I have no doubt. On April 4th, uh, the report that we leaked, the final version is being released. So of course it will have edits from, it will be watered down or, uh, you know, it wasn't, uh, yeah, it'll be watered down and it will be released on Monday the 4th. On Wednesday the 6th, we will be taking direct action in around 25 countries around the world. We are currently mobilizing in 20 countries. And on that day, we are asking every single uh, person involved to push themselves as hard to act as if it's the end of the world, right? So in the global north, people will be uh, being arrested. They will be going to prison. They will be enduring police violence and they will be making great personal sacrifice because when we tuck our children in at night, we say we would do anything for them and we mean it. So on that Wednesday, we will act like that truth and we will act like our children are in front of us and we will do whatever it takes. Um, we're expecting around 250 scientists to be involved with that. And then on the uh, Friday and Saturday, the 8th and the 9th, we will uh, slightly lower the pressure, but increase the numbers. So we'll have around 750 scientists involved doing things like pasting of scientific papers, um, blocking the road, doing t rebellious teachings, as well as some legal disruption. Uh, this, I want to be very careful to say that uh, when we're talking about arrest and imprisonment, I'm talking about the global north, who obviously have a much greater debt than the global south. In the global south, because of uh, obvious reasons, uh, they will generally not involve arrest, but it's risky enough just to be involved. Um, it is the least we can do in the global north to risk arrest. 
Um, as well as that, which itself I think will be uh, world changing, we are mobilizing for strikes and occupations of universities. Initially, that's going to start in Spain, but we are going to globalize, uh, make it global, especially in Europe and Africa. Um, we are currently mobilizing very strongly in Europe, so in the UK, Spain, Germany, France, Italy, Netherlands, Nordic countries, uh, just about to be Portugal, uh, in around 10 countries in Africa, India, in Asia, and in around seven countries in Latin America, like Ecuador, Panama, Chile, Argentina, and I can't remember the rest. Um, and we're also mobilizing in, in the US. So it sounds like a big claim to say that this is gonna be massive, but we're already well on track. And we have, so we are doing this talk series, we are doing a mass email to a million scientists, and we are doing in-person talks all around the world. Um, and, you know, we can't settle for anything less. Of course we have to do this. When we started Scientists Rebellion, there was a lot of talk about if scientists do direct action, do they get more or less credibility? Um, we don't hear that anymore. So we've already started to shift the Overton window. Um, it is clear that scientists who take direct action are taken more seriously. If you say it's the end of the world and then you sit down and you drink a cup of tea, it's hard to take you seriously. You have to get out there on the streets. Um, of course, there are exceptions and there are some reasonable reasons why people won't act, but almost everyone should be taken to the streets and acting. Um, so that's April, our history and generally why. And then you can say the final thing is the big picture. What are we aiming for, right? This isn't, we're not messing around. We have a big picture strategy because we need a revolution. We had there, it's very clear who has caused this climate crisis, uh, the people in power. And it's very clear that they have to be removed. Um, so that calls for revolution. So we are unashamedly a revolutionary group. We're not seeking reform because this system cannot be reformed. It has to be revolution. Um, so what Scientist Rebellion will, is aiming to do, and I'm confident it will do, is within one to two years, we would normalize disobedience within the scientific community to the point where it's like it was always the truth. At the moment, there aren't scientists taking that much action. We were, you know, there's 20 of us on that bridge when it was pissing it down with rain and we started things going, right? Within a year, year and a half, it will be like it's always been the case. What, you know, uh, Fran said to me earlier, and I thought it was brilliant. Um, what we want to do is what Greta did for the youth. Now it's standard for the uh, for young people to rebel and to strike. That's what we need to do for scientists. I thought it should have always been the case. Scientists should have been at the front of this thing. It shouldn't have been working people. It shouldn't have been young people. It should have been scientists. We are relatively privileged, you know, I'm sat here as a white cis male from Britain, you know, I'm dripping with privilege. The very, very, very least I can do is risk some of that. Um, we should have always been doing it. Just imagine how different things would have been if we do, if scientists had been on the front lines risking everything, we wouldn't have been in this position, but it's not too late. We can do it and we just have to change it right now. That's me. I think Fran's next. Yes, I'm next. I'm just trying to find my notes again. Uh, thank you, Mike, for a great overview. I think this this really got me going, especially the, the last part that we should be the ones who are doing this. I always thought that, like, why are the young people standing up and we scientists are still in our offices? That just doesn't seem fair and doesn't seem right. It's not their fight to fight. It's our fight to fight because we, we got there in that mess while they were still babies or not even alive. Um, so we are getting close to doing our breakout rooms. But before that, I just want to tell you how you can join Scientist Rebellion or take part in the April action. So if you're interested, um, send me a private message in the chat with your name and your email. 
And if you already know what you want to do in April or how you want to help, or if you have a special skill, you can add that in there. You don't have to. And we will make sure we follow up with you in the next few days. Um, if you're not sure yet, but tomorrow or the next day, you're like, oh, actually, I really want to take part. Then every Monday we have an induction meeting. And I will put the meeting link in the chat here, and you can also find it um, um, on our website and on our social media. So every Monday there's a meeting where you can learn more about um, Scientist Rebellion and learn how you can be part of it. And you can always also send us an email. Um, I'll put the email as well in the chat. So if you have any questions about joining, about us, send us an email and we will reply to you.